given you um, we're going to next week I'll finish up and then we'll move into one other thing but I do have the word of the Lord for you this morning as we talk about living under God's hand living in grace and victory um, we turn this morning we're going to look primarily at, uh, at one specific Old Testament passage um, as we look at this but as we get into that we have been looking at and we've been talking about living in grace and victory it's something that each one of us wants I, I don't know a single person that would choose I want to live a defeated Christian life and I want to live I don't I don't care if I don't have the grace of God I can make it I don't know a single Christian who would say that am I right yeah uh, if if if, you, if any one of us would say that, we've got bigger problems than can be helped with one message this morning. None of us would say that. We all want to have victory as we live Christian lives. Because all of us know, we all know what it feels like to live a defeated Christian life, don't we? Do you know? I know what it feels like to live a defeated Christian life. I know what it feels like to live without the grace of God. And I don't want to live that way. And I know you don't want to live that way. God is so good to us that he shows us in his word how we may live a life of grace and victory in him. And so that's what we've been looking at these last two weeks. We'll continue this morning. We're going to look specifically at one area. Uh, I told you we would get to this. What about those times when we come to the point where, God, I haven't chosen, chosen to be humbled, but I'm being humbled and the pressure's really heavy and it's really hard. I told you we would get to that. We're going to get to that today. Um, but we, we go back again very quickly to our two passages, James chapter 4, uh, next slide, and 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And I'm saying that one over and over again so that I hope you get it. That, that we get it down in our spirits and we really remember that if we don't remember anything else for ourselves God gives grace God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble there's a basic there's a basic message for us there's something basic for us there and both of these writers say it and then both of them talk about God as we humble ourselves as we submit we will then be under God and to God and under his hand he will he'll lift us up he'll, he'll bring us up out of this time what is not included here but both of them say is that um, we resist the devil the devil the devil will flee and we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well so he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble and we talked about why that is so it is the nature of the one who used to be our father the devil he used to be our father it is his nature to live and operate in pride in independence apart from God that's what made him Satan in the first place when he chose I will be like God rather than submitting to God's rule rather than follow, rather than living and operating and working in the sphere and in the place and in the way in which God had created him he chose another way and that's exactly how he tempted Eve in the garden when he said oh if you eat you'll be like you'll be like God that's why he doesn't want you to eat and brothers and sisters if there is anything the devil is not he is not creative and he has done the same thing throughout man's history from the beginning until now his temptation to you and to me is still you can do it yourself do it your own way of course we don't recognize that you often as the devil or the devil's voice instead we just kind of feel like well I'm being independent well I'm gonna do this and we rely on ourselves instead but it's the devil it's the devil's way it's the enemy's way and he always he always comes that way it's exactly when I said he's not creative that's how he came to Eve you can do it this way instead it's how he came to Jesus as well when he tempted him in the wilderness. You can do it this way. You can depend on this way instead. And it's how he comes to us still. And so that's why God says to you and me, I oppose the proud, but I give grace to the humble. And when we have the grace of God, then in, in humility, we will make it through. We will overcome. We will be victorious as we live our Christian lives. 
as we live our Christian lives, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this today, and we'll get, more, we'll get into this more next week, but I, to me, I, I believe, although there are many things that we pray for in this world, when it comes to the battle for us as Christians, I believe the battleground is primarily one place and one place only. I really do. I think it's our hearts, primarily. It's, oh, you say, well, the government structure, the this, the that. Yeah, but you know what? All of those things are things that will perish. All of those things are, that are things for, that, that are for this life only. What God cares about and what the devil cares about is what is eternal and what will last forever and what is made in the image of God and that for which God has a wonderful plan and that on whom those on whom God has set his love on mankind. And so the battle is here. The battle is here. And this is where he comes. And that's, this is where the battle is won. This is where the ba battle is lost. And so as we look at this, this is why God says, I'll give you grace. I'll give you grace, but if you're going to be proud, like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, I won't give you grace for that. I won't bless that. I can't bless it. How could I bless something in my, the beings that I love, those that I've created in my image, how could I bless something that will cause death and destruction and damnation? I will not. I will not do it. And so he's very, very clear in his word. We looked last week at someone who is probably nobody's hero, but should be. If, uh, um, if I were to say, if I were to ask you, who's your Bible hero? What, what would some of you say? Well, who would you say? Okay, somebody over here said Joseph. I really love Joseph too. Somebody else, who would you say? Paul, yeah. David. Anybody else? Yeah. Joshua, Daniel. Personally, I like Caleb. The older I get, the more I like Caleb. <laughs> Because Caleb, as a much older person, comes to Joshua and he says, Here I am, I'm this old now, but I am still well able to do everything, you know, so that. So the older I get, the more I like Caleb. Um, and I like Joshua a lot too. So we have these various heroes of the Bible. But honestly, as we looked at, and as we looked last week, I think there's this Old Testament character that should be more people's hero than is, and that is good old Ezra the Old Testament scribe. So let's look at that verse again just as, as, a, as a reminder because we've talked about the humbling that comes uh, as we submit to the Lord. And remember we talked about that submitting means to what? Obey. That O-B-E-Y. Four-letter word. Okay? That four-letter word to obey. That's, what the, the, that's the meaning of the word. And we have this beautiful picture of Ezra we looked in chapter 7 and chapter 8. Remember we talked about this six times. Ezra talks about the hand of God that is upon him. It's a gracious hand. We often think, oh, the, the mighty hand of God. But it's a hand. It's a gracious hand. So it's a hand full of grace. It's also a hand of protection as well. And six times Ezra talks about the hand of God upon him and all the things that are accomplished because the hand of God is upon him. And we saw the key for this. And what was the key? Here it was in Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had set his heart. What does it mean to set, his heart, to set one's heart? To determine, to devote oneself, to study and that means to seek, to inquire after, to look into the law of the Lord and to what? Obey it. To do it. That's right. And to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. We didn't talk about this last week, but I want you to see something here this morning. Those of you that desire to serve the Lord, those of us that desire to work for the Lord, God, I'm going to do this for you. Or we feel that God has called us to do something for him. We want to serve. We want to minister. I want you to see something in the life of Ezra. For Ezra, there was no public service. There was no public ministry before private devotion, submission, and obedience to God. Do you see that? It's a, it's a process. It's a step. What was in Ezra's heart in his relationship with God, with God was set and was right before there was anything of the carrying out 
of, of God's plan and God's will and God's ministry. Does that make sense to us this morning? Very often we get the cart before the horse. We think, God, I'm going to do this for you. God, I'm going to do that for you. When in our lives we have not established basic obediences, basic submission, basic basic humbling before the Lord just in the everyday areas of our lives. I, I remember one time long ago speaking with a woman, a person who had this big idea of what they were going to do for God. It was uh, the, when I talked with the person, it was big, hu big, huge things, really big, huge things. But as I talked further with the person, I found out, and I'm just giving you an example, and I'm not trying to be legalistic, but I want us to see this. I mean, it, it was things that spanned several countries that this person wanted to do. But the more I talked with this person, I found out that this person did not even regularly read the Word of God. She admitted that sometimes two or three months would pass with her Bible by her bed and she never opened it to read, to seek after, and to study the Word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, there has to be a foundation for ministry in our lives. There has to be. And it's got to be right. And God, sa God says this is how it has to be. And so we see it in Ezra. And that, that wasn't the, the main point, but we do see this. Ezra's an Old Testament hero. He really, really is. He determined, God, what does your word say? And it's more than just, okay, read chapter one, read chapter two, read chapter three. It was, God, what does your word say to me? What is the truth in your word? Because God's word, what does Paul say? It's living, it's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It comes into our lives and we encounter, brothers and sisters, it's not just that we encounter the Word of God. We encounter God Himself in His Word. He speaks to us. He is there with us as we, as we feed on the Word of God and as we open our hearts and as we open our lives to it. I believe that is why Ezra was successful and had the hand of God upon him in grace and, and, and what God had called him to do worked out. And that's true for every one of us brothers and sisters. You may say, well, I'm no Ezra. Well, I'm no Ezra either. But there are things that God has called me to do that Ezra has never, was never called to do. There are things God has called you to do or will call you to do that nobody else has called to do. But it requires something from us as well. It requires a response, an obedience, a humility, a humbling. And we see this in the life of Ezra. So, woohoo, a new Old Testament hero for us. How about that? So maybe the next time somebody says something, you say, yeah, Ezra, he's my guy, okay? And we see this in the life of Ezra. God, I am determined. I'm going to know your word for my life, and I am going to obey. Now, I want to give you a New Testament example because James in chapter 4, the passage that's our, one of our main passages, says, Therefore, submit yourselves to, before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And he uses the word submit, which is sometimes uh, um, translated humble, depending on the translation that you have. The foundation of the word means also it means to obey. We talked about this last week, right? And last week, the primary thing we talked about was obeying, obeying, obeying. That's one of the basic ways we humble ourselves before God. But we want to talk more about this word submit because we see it in another place and in, in the New Testament. And I want to give you an example of that. Luke 2.51. And this is actually, this is a passage, this is a... a um, a story in the Bible that you know that each one of us knows very well. Look at it, Luke, Luke 2, 51. What is the, what's the context here? This is speaking of whom? Absolutely, it's speaking of Jesus. It's when he's 12 years old, and how much did he know at this point? There are things that we know and that we don't know. Remember, they had gone up to Jerusalem, and then they head back to Nazareth, and um, Mary and Joseph can't find, jo can't find Jesus or whatever. They go back to Jerusalem, and after three days, they find him in the temple. I'll bet Mary, his mother, scolded him like anything. Parents, have you ever lost your kids before? Have you? Did you scold? You were, you were, you were scared, so you kind of scolded them, right? Where were you? You could have been lost. And you, I kind of think of Mary kind of doing that, saying, Son, 
Do you know how much you scared me? You gave me gray hairs. <laughs> and, and we laugh, but, but you know, you know, we see these, we see these medieval pictures and, and Renaissance pictures or whatever, and Mary's this saintly with a halo and whatever. Folks, mothers in the room. That's how Mary was. Ma Mary was a mother, so you can, you can imagine that. But what I want you to see is what Jesus does. He's 12 years old, and there is obviously a realization how deep, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly. But remember what Jesus says? He says, I must be about, I, I, I'm in my father's house. Would, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? But here's what I want you to see. What does it say? Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was what? Obedient to them. And the word is also in some translations, submissive. It is exactly the same word that James uses in chapter 4 when he says submit to the Lord submit to the Lord so we see this even in the life of Jesus and I want you to see Jesus submitted to his earthly parents to his earthly mother and father but that was the pattern of his life he was God God the Son but his pattern of life was one of submission and obedience. Look at the next passage, and this is, this is in Hebrews 5, the writer to Hebrews. Look at this. This passage is a little bit long, and you might kind of think, well, how does this fit? Look with me as you think about submission in the life of Jesus. What does it say? During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. This is describing various times, but you know what this is talking about very specifically? This is in the garden that night when he knows the cross is ahead of him. And he was heard. Why was he heard? Because of his reverent submission. Some translations say because of his reverence. The idea, the meaning, the meaning is the same here. Now look at verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he he suffered. He learned obedience. He learned obedience, brothers and sisters, not as God, not as God, but as a son to a father. And as he was obedient to his earthly mother and father, he was obedient to the heavenly father as a son to a father. And he was obedient and he fought the battle. What did I say earlier? The battle primarily, it's the battle here. It's the heart. It's the will. It's the choices that we make. And Jesus fought and won so that you and I, when we fight, we might receive the grace that we need that we might win and that we might overcome. There is nothing in me that can, in myself, in myself, that can overcome the devil. Please understand what I'm saying. There is nothing in me, in myself, that can beat the devil. I don't care that I'm a pastor. I don't care that it doesn't matter that I've been a Christian for how many years of my life. The only thing in me, the only thing in you, the only part of us that will have victory over the enemy is that which is of God, that which is like Christ. It is Jesus in me. Why? Because He went to the cross. But oh, brothers and sisters, He won the battle before He went to the cross. Where was the battle? The battle was in the garden that night. And once He'd won that battle, He'd already said it. He went to the cross. The battle was over and done with by that point. He had obeyed at this point. He had submitted at this point. The cross, though it was physically difficult, he'd already won the battle. That's where the battle was. And brothers and sisters, for you and for me as well, that's where the battle is. It's not these outer things, oh, this and it's that. It's in the heart. It's in the will. It's in the choice. Am I going to submit? Am I going to obey? Am I going to depend, oh God, on your grace, submitting to you, humbled under your hand, or am I going to do it my way? Am I going to depend on myself? Am I going to fight back? Jesus won. And because Jesus won, He became, He is what? The author of all salvation, and He's called the God of all grace. He has all the grace you and I need to make it through. All the grace we need. You think it's hard. You think it's tough. 
Humble yourselves before God and you will have the grace you need to make it through. It's a battle. It's a battle. And there's an obedience and submission. I want to give you an example from my own life. Uh, there are many examples I could give you, but I just want to give you one. It was this week I was praying about something, but I'd been praying about it before this week. I've been praying about it for the, more, for the last month or more, and it has been a battle in my heart and in my spirit. And I, have, I had told the Lord, God, I want to obey you. God, I want to do what is right. But it just went over and over again in my heart, and it went over and over again in my thoughts. And maybe for some people that's not such a battle. For me, it was really... Uh, it was really a battle of thoughts in my mind. And, and some of you are really kind of nodding. And I kind of think, please don't take this, I'm not being sexist, but I wonder if perhaps women at times have more problems with this than men do. I, I don't know. Because just then I just saw a whole bunch of women go <laughs> like that. And I saw all the men sitting there looking at me like, <laughs> like this. We have battles in different, in different areas, but I, I really prayed about it, and I was very sincere. I was very sincere. And I prayed about it, and I told God, God, I want to, I submit to you, God, I want to do what's right. And I, and I know everything that the Word of God says about letting go of anger and don't hold on to this and forgive and have a gentle answer, all of these things. I know all of these things. And I prayed about it, and I talked with the Lord about it. But still... Mm, it was just over and over in my mind. So I had kept on praying about it. And I'd already told the Lord all of these things. And I was submitting the best way I knew. And Monday afternoon, on, on, on the, the day off that I take on Mondays, by the way, that's why sometimes I don't answer your texts and things on Mondays. Because I'm trying to have a Sabbath day also. And it's usually on my Monday. And I was climbing the mountain behind my house, and it's, it's, a, it's a long way up, and sometimes it's about an hour up, and then it's about an hour back down or whatever. And I love that time because it's quiet. I get to hear the birds. Um, I almost I don't see anybody, and I, I talk to the Lord quietly and sometimes out loud, and sometimes I just, just enjoy nature. So I was hiking up. It was in the afternoon, and about halfway up the mountain, I suddenly realized I wasn't praying, I wasn't singing as I often do. Instead, my mind was still it was still just going over and over and over in my mind. And I'm not trying to make I'm just being very practical and I'm not trying to make light of it because James, when he talks about this in chapter four, do you know what James says when he says, when you come to the Lord and you humble humble yourself? He says, change your laughter to mourning. And what he's talking about is sometimes with our, our sins and our disobedience and our pride, we don't take it seriously at all. <laughs> it's a light thing. It's not a light thing. And so I'm not trying to make light of it. But I just stopped. I was so sick of myself. I was so sick of my thoughts. I just stopped and I just looked up. I said, God, I choose you and I'm going to obey you. God, I'm choosing. And I just said it out loud. Lord, your word says this, and so I'm going to do it. God, I don't care what my feelings are doing right now. God, I don't care my thoughts going round and round like that. God, I'm going to obey you. And then I said, and devil, I want you to know I'm going to obey God. Whatever you keep doing, I'm going to obey you. God, I choose you. What you tell me to do, I'll do. What you say, that's what I'll say. If you say shut up, I'll shut up. If you say keep your mouth closed, I'll keep my mouth closed. If you say say this, I'll say this. And otherwise, it's up to you, Lord. And when I said that, and when I did that, boom, that took care of it. That took care of it. That took care of it. And maybe it wasn't until that point that I really, truly submitted to the Lord and then received His grace so that I could have victory to go through. So the battle was won then. And then the working out of it came later in the week. But the battle was won then. And I was so grateful because I was so sick of having it go, oh, filling my mind. That may not be what works for you, but I think a lot of times it may be. The battle is here. The battle is here. And we see it, Jesus did it. Jesus did it so we can do it. We can do it. And he has won the victory for us. And he lives in us that we might live in him and for him in victory and in grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Now, let's switch gears and let's look at, we're going to look at the Old Testament. I told you we were going to come to that point. When we come to the point where, God, I didn't choose this humbling, but I am being pressed down and pressed in and squeezed and I want it to stop. And I've prayed and it hasn't stopped. And I've knocked and the door hasn't opened. And I've begged and you haven't answered. And it just keeps on. And it just keeps on. Oh God. And some of us, when we come to this place, if it's been going on for a while, if we were really honest, we would admit and we would acknowledge I'm disappointed in God and I'm starting to get bitter because I thought God loved me and I thought God cared about me and it's still going on. What's going on? There's an Old Testament example that will help us. God's people were in Egypt and they'd been there for about 400 years and at some point they'd become slaves to Pharaoh. But God loved his people. And so he raised up a leader. But as he raised him up, he had to prepare the leader because Moses wasn't ready to lead them either. Moses was a, oh my gracious, Moses' way to bring deliverance was to kill people. <laughs> Don't you think he would have killed some Israelites in the wilderness if, he, if God hadn't worked on him? You bet. You bet. And so God had to work on Moses first and get him ready so that he could do what God had called him to do. And then the time came when God delivered his people out of Egypt, led them through the Red, led them through the Red Sea, and within the space of about 10 months brought them to the border of the land that he had promised them. Now some of us might say, wait, 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 no, not 10 months, it was 40 years, Pastor. Not at first it wasn't. Not at first it wasn't, it was about, seems like it was about 10 months. But the giant, the giants in the land and the walled cities overshadowed the blessings, the bounty, and the beauty of the land of promise. And they turned back, they rebelled in disbelief. Oh, brothers and sisters, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a month of lessons in, in Deuteronomy. But they looked at it and they only looked at their own resources, which is what we do a lot of times, right? And they looked at it and they said, we can't take this land. We can't go into this land. And they began to rebel and they said, let's go back to Egypt and, 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 and let's kill Joshua and Caleb. Let's stone them and then let's go back to Egypt. And they, in other words, this is our resources. This is what we can do and this is what we cannot do. And some of us would say, but they've been a nation of slaves. Weren't they humbled enough? Apparently not. Because at that point, they looked at what they had and what they were. And they said, we can't do it. And they turned from faith in God. And so we know the rest of that story. We know then that God led them through the wilderness. In the end, it was about 40 years. He fed them with manna until we get all the way to the time as they stand on the edge and they're ready to go into the land again. And that's where we're going to turn in our, in our uh, few remaining minutes this morning. And some of you right now are saying, what does that have to do with humbling? I thought we were going to talk about humbling. We surely are. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 8 this morning. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 8. What does it have to do with dump humbling? It has everything to do with humbling. Deuteronomy 8, 2. Uh, did you know that the, did you know that this was in Deuteronomy? Mm. Moses is standing before the people. Deuteronomy has 34 chapters. Chapters 1 to 33 are his farewell address. So whenever you think Pastor Renee and Pastor Jennifer are preaching too long, you remember Paul who preached all night and Eutychus fell out of the window, almost died, or did die. I think he did die and that he was raised up and go back and think of go back and think of Moses in Deuteronomy who who preaches for 33 chapters okay you think how long 33 chapters took but Deuteronomy the first 33 chapters is the farewell address of Moses he gives them a history and then he prepares them for the land they're going to go into personally I believe the key is Deuteronomy 8 
It's Deuteronomy 8. And what does he say? Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might, what? Humble you. Humble you. Deuteronomy 8.3. What does it say? He humbled you by letting you, letting you go hungry. Deuteronomy 8.16. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known in order to, what? Humble you and test you. Here's the key, brothers and sisters, to the wilderness. Here's the key to what was going on. God was doing something. Now, I want to say something right now, and I don't want anybody to get hurt or offended this morning or think I'm pointing at you or whatever, because I'm, God has to speak to you, okay? God the Holy Spirit has to speak to you. And what I want to say to you is this. God being God, He's a multitasker. Did you, you knew that, right? You knew that God's a multi you know that God's a multitasker and God is almost always doing more than one thing at one time in your life and my life. He's doing all sorts of things. But in this case, he was at the very least doing this in the lives of his people. So God in those 40 difficult years had a purpose. He was humbling them. Did they choose it? No, they didn't. Was it difficult? Yes, it was. Was it short or long? Long, long, it was long. And he was doing something necessary in their lives. Now, let's see what he was doing. So you've got those. Um, your homework at the end of today, if you will take it, is going to be Deuteronomy chapter 8, okay? So Deuteronomy chapter 8. But let's come back to Deuteronomy 8, 2, and then in just a minute we'll look at the next one. Look at this passage. Here's the complete passage now in Deuteronomy 8, 2. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness. Now they knew that already. That was nothing new to them. But now here comes something new. Now Moses says, so that he might humble you and test you. Uh oh, uh oh, now bells should start going off in everybody's minds right now. To humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would what? Obey His commands. Ding, 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 ding. Everything we've been talking about up to this point. I want to ask you something this morning. God is God. Did God already know what was in their hearts? Yes. Of course He knew what was in their hearts. He was God. But the problem was they didn't know what was in their hearts. They didn't know the idolatry that was there. They didn't know the pride that was there. They didn't know the self-reliance. And you say, but they were a nation of slaves. Weren't they humbled already? Apparently not. Because all they could look at is, what can I provide for myself? Well, we don't have this. I don't have that. And they looked only at what they had. They looked only at what they could provide. They looked only at what they could do. Now, brothers and sisters, let's get it this morning. You and I are the same way, aren't we? So often, so often. And the, the picture that we have here, Moses says he was humbling you so that what was in your hearts would come out. Brothers and sisters, you and I have things in our hearts we don't even know they're there. Some of these things, we don't even know we have such stinky attitudes sometimes. And we do, don't we? We don't even know how wavering we are at times. We don't even know how unforgiving and unloving and how hard we are at times. And, and I'm, I include myself in that. All of us. And so God in love begins to put the pressure down. He begins to put the pressure on so that you and I, just as the children of Israel did, we have our hearts and we have our wills. And at that moment, we choose. We choose. We choose. How are we going to choose? How are you going to choose? Until it comes up. Until it comes out. Until there's action. We don't know. We don't. I can say big things but it's what I do. I can say, oh God, I love you, but it's what I do. I can say, oh God, you're first in my life. You're my priority, but it's what I do. I can say, oh God, I honor you, but it's what I do. Words are easy to say, 
but the choices of our hearts and our wills under pressure and under the humbling of God show what is really in our hearts. And God, because He loves us, will humble us with that pressure. And I want to tell you something right now. Many times, many times, He puts the pressure on and He keeps the pressure on. Why? Because any of us can make it through on our own when it's a short pressure test, can't we? I can grit my teeth, and so can you. And we make it through. And God, because he loves us, says, I'm not going to let you make it through on your own. And the pressure comes. And the pressure comes. And you say, you mean that's what God's been doing all this time? I, uh, please understand that's not what I'm saying to you this morning. But what I am saying to you is there's a biblical example. And it is absolutely biblical and scriptural for you and for me to come to God if this is what we are going through. I'm not being presumptuous and saying, oh, this is going on because you've got pride in your life. I am not saying that. I am not saying, oh, this is going on because you have an area of your life where there's not been submission and obedience. I'm not saying that. And I prayed so strongly about this. I prayed so strongly about this. You've got to talk to God about this because God is doing many different things in our lives. I, I really mean that. But the biblical, but there is an example that is so strong for you and for me. There really, really is. And God in love, we're, we're not going to get to it this morning because our, our time is... Our time is coming to a close. But I want to, may I go, go ahead and just give you a preview later on, just to encourage you this morning, because some of you, I know you're struggling this morning, and you say, this is so hard. If you look a little bit later, it says, God humbled you. Please listen. God humbled you so that in the end it would come out well for you. That's what it says. So that it would come out well for you. Brothers and sisters, God is for you. He's for you. He loves you. He has a good plan for your life. You say, well, it doesn't feel like it. It's been hard and it's been hard for a long time. Then get together with God. I, I in my own life, there are character issues, or there have been character issues. I thought I was just fine, brothers and sisters. But there are things that God knew about my character, and He knows about my character. If there's going to be any change, it's not going to be through a quick prayer, however sincere, and I mean it, sincere. There are things in our hearts and in our lives that are deep, that, that, that make us that form who we are that just aren't like Jesus. They're just not like Jesus. And God says, because I love you, I'm, I'm, I don't want that to remain in you. I want to change you. I want to change your character. I want to make you like Jesus. And so the pressure comes, and the fire gets hotter, and the fire gets hotter. But he does it in love, whether or not you would obey his commands. And I want us to close with this this morning. Is our time? Okay, we've still got time. Look at, look at verse 3. We're going to close with this passage this morning. I want you to be encouraged by this. He says again, Moses says, He humbled you by letting you go hungry, and then he gave you manna to eat. Aren't you glad that he didn't stop with he humbled you by letting you go hungry? If, God, if, if that's, honestly, if that's all it said, you and I could say, God's a bad God. He let me, he let me go hungry. Because sometimes that's what we feel, right? In, in our situations, and please understand, we all hunger in various areas, right? We all hunger. Hunger is that point. Hunger is that point of need. Hunger is that place of lack. Hunger is the, 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 the situation of insufficiency in ourselves. They, and then, but it says... Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known. They couldn't go to the manna store and buy it. 
They couldn't go get manna seeds and plant it and grow some manna. They couldn't go to the parking shop and buy manna bread. They couldn't do any of those things. And I'm, 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 I'm putting it in that way so we can understand it. Why? They couldn't get it anywhere except from where? From God and God only. And they could only get it from God in God's way, right? It's going to come in the morning. You got to go out and get it in the morning for six days. On the sixth day, you gather enough for the seventh day. Don't save it over. You don't whatever. What was God teaching them? God was teaching them obedience. He was giving them an opportunity for obedience and submission. And he was teaching them, I will provide for you. You can count on me. Now, he was teaching them more than that. I'm simplifying this morning. He was showing them at your point of need, I provide for you. They were looking at what they could provide. They couldn't. He brought them into the wilderness where there was no way they could provide for themselves and they were humbled in their lack. They were humbled in their need. They were humbled in their insufficiency. And our God treats us, deals with us, with you and me old Christians, young Christians, exactly the same way. He brings us to the place and the point and the situation where I ain't got it and you don't have it either. And there's only one place where that need can be met and it's going to be to go to God. God's way, not my way. God's way. And then God will give me manna. God will give me what I need in that moment. It may be grace. It may be a spirit to forgive. It may be love for the unlovely. Any of these things. But what does he say? Moses says it. And then Jesus says it. Matthew 4.4, 4, Luke 4.4, 4, and then later. Three, time, three times in the New Testament. This is what Jesus says. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Understand that? That word, without getting into all the Greek, that is the rhema word. That's the living word. That's the word that comes from the mouth of God. The spoken word. The word that fits. The word that suits our situation at the time of need. At the moment of need. Exactly what we need. It's not going to the Word of God saying, Oh, now I've got all these promises of God. That's not what this is. It is that living Word of God that meets our need. What is your need? The manna of God is available to us, brothers and sisters. What is our need? But it only comes when we are humbled before God and we come God's way. God's way. And then we receive what we need. When we need it. How we need it. Exactly. Exactly what we need. That is how. That is, and, and I, this morning, I want you to understand, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. If you've been going through something for a long time, well, Pastor Jennifer's preaching at me. I am not. <laughs> I mean it. I mean it. You talk to God about it. But we have an example here, a strong example. God will provide, but God does humble. And he does it because he loves us, that it might go well with us. So we're just going to close this morning. I'm going to ask you the same question. I, I ask you to ask again the same question that you did last week as we close our eyes. And the question is, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What are you saying? Not, oh, Pastor Jennifer said whatever. No. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Is there an area of submission and obedience that is lacking in our lives and the humbling of God may have been going on for a long time? Is there an area of need where you just say, Oh God, I need, I need your manna. I need your manna. I must have it. It's what's needed for that moment. Holy Spirit, you who breathe life into the written word of God, we ask you this morning, to breathe your life, your words, your manna into our hearts, into our lives, and into our, into our situations. We choose to submit. We choose to obey. God, I confess my heart is so deceitful. It's so deceitful. I don't even know what's in there until you show me and it comes out and then I'm horrified 
and yet you love me. And if I come to you, you will give me manna. You will give me manna. We come to you this morning. We come to you this morning. In our need, we submit. We humble ourselves. In Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, I urge you, I urge you today. This was a short time. Please, before you get up and start leaving, please, please wait just a minute. Jess, please wait just a minute. Let's wait. I urge you.